On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are diving into Star Trek First Contact in our Picard Primer. And then we're going to have a song by The Garage inspired by First Contact. It's all right after this. Welcome to the Star Trek Universe Podcast. My name is Matthew Carroll. David C. Robertson here. Man. Yeah. First contact, uh, eh? Uh-huh. I this is uh this is one of my favorites, if not my favorite Star Trek movie. I can't remember what I rated them when we did our ratings. I, I can't either. And you know, to be fair, we did say in the review that there was no telling. It depends on the day, but... Uh, yeah, I think this was yeah. my top, and yeah, I, I still feel that way. I really, really love this movie. Even my least favorite Star Trek movies, though, I enjoy quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. But this one holds a special place in my heart, I think, because it's so well done. It, it's the mm-hmm. it's the height of the Borg. It's the Borg before they uh, kind of were overdone or felt trite in some of Voyager, you know? Well, this is, this is the moment where... We lose the mystery of the Borg, and anything after this feels trite, so... Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe that's it. This is the big rev- revelation, They're like, oh, oh well, there's a queen, and now it's just like, oh, now, from now on, the queen is going to be the mustache-twirling villain of the Borg. See? But I, it was awesome here. I just rewatched all the Borg episodes of Voyager, and I don't think she's mustache-twirling. Really? Yeah, I mean, she's obviously evil from our perspective, but she mm-hmm. she just like Hugh uh, in the in the previous episodes uh, we've talked about. Um, she's not like me. <laughs> just like Hugh, she doesn't think the Borg is a bad thing, right? Like she's mustache twirly if you want to just say because she's bad, but like she doesn't think of herself as bad. She thinks of herself as uh, you know wanting to save the galaxy from disorder. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's, and that's, that's her, like, just, she's, she's a, she's an evangelical Borg, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. I I need to go back and watch Voyager again. I do. I I admit it. Yeah. I rewatched all the Borg episodes in preparation for Picard because we're not going to have time to do as many as we'd planned on. Right. And, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot. Actually, we're probably not going to have time to get into any Voyager. Uh, maybe we'll have a 10 minute discussion about seven of nine. (laughs) 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 We'll tackle that in Picard. Yeah, we didn't make it through all the Picard <laughs> stuff, so uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. let's talk about first contact. All right. What's your what's your major? Uh, what's your what's your favorite parts? What's your least favorite parts? I don't know. What you got? Um, I love most all everything of this movie. Um, just everything. I the the one part that is always going to bother me is of <laughs> course, you know, the, why wouldn't the Borg go back in time further? But I have my own headcanon for that. I think they wouldn't go back in time because they were hoping to uh catch the Vulcans maybe. Mm. Maybe they were going to like assimilate and then do the warp jump as it was supposed to happen. Of course, you oh, know. Oh yeah. And then let the Vulcans come and then they could sneak a uh, sleeper uh, Borg onto the uh, the Vulcan ship and go back and, and, and fest uh, Vulcan. Interesting. My head cannon for that has always been uh, we don't know how time travel works in this scenario. Mm-hmm. And my assumption is that time travel works in such a way that it is costly to do. Like, and maybe mm-hmm. it's costlier to go back further and they're machines and they're just picking the most efficient time to go back to. That's always been my, mm-hmm. my reasoning for their, like, cause we don't see the board time travel much. <clears throat> and so clearly they can. Right. Uh, so why don't they do it all the time? Why haven't they done this before or since? Uh, and my logic is because whatever it is, it, it's costly to them. It, it costs f- some sort of, some sort of fuel or some sort of tachyon whatevers to create these sorts of uh, time travel things. Time travel is interesting in Star Trek because it seems like it's always available when needed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was confused by why they wouldn't have uh, gone back in time before they got to the Alpha Quadrant, so there wouldn't be a fight, and they wouldn't have lost their ship. If they had made it all the way back in that, like, giant cube, yeah, it's over. 
Sure. You just never know. Maybe they know the history of the Alpha Quadrant. Maybe they know that there's a bunch of Vulcans kicking around that would have uh, given them trouble if they'd been any further away from Earth. They yeah, but get... there's no way those Vulcans would have been able to take down a freaking 24th century Borg. Probably not, but they would have... Maybe they all just wanted to disrupt. They're, 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 they're picking their battles, what they want to do in the time travel stream, mm-hmm. and they have calculated that if they go back in time, you know... Uh, somewhere across the galaxy and then take a 24th century Borg ship across the galaxy. Like maybe they never get a chance to assimilate certain technologies because those technologies never exist because they screw up the galaxy in such a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is just them trying to take humans off the board because they've been such a thorn in their side all this time. Yeah. The humans are the most resistant uh, as they talk about in Voyager a good bit. Part of me wonders if uh, it wasn't just the time travel thing was like a plan C or something that was like a very calculated plan C. <laughs> like yeah. we're going to try to attack, attack them now, but if it doesn't work for some reason, we're going to send like this ship off and, and go into the past. Yeah, absolutely. And, th- and that works pretty well with the theory I had about, uh, it being costly to do, you yeah. know, maybe they thought they could just take it with force. And when they couldn't, they were like, well, I guess we're doing this very costly option of time travel. Mm hmm. Um, okay, so what do we get special from Picard here? Uh, we get Picard realizing that the Borg, he's willing to do a lot to bring down the Borg, including getting all his friends killed. So his mm-hmm. like his revenge, he's Ahab. I mean, and that's 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 the the thrust of this movie. Um, yeah, he realizes that he has revenge in his heart, and man, when he quotes. Melville, and he says, you know, like, if my if my chest were a cannon, I would plunge my heart at thee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. Something like that. It's so good. I would uh, I would fire my heart at thee or whatever. Uh, it's it's so good and so well acted on on his part, and and it's so well done with like him and uh, Wolf. Uh, oh gosh, what's her name? Wolfrey. Wolfred Wolford. <laughs> Alfred Woodard. Alfred Woodard. Thank you. <laughs> <A> wolf. Wolfie. <laughs> uh, Black Mariah. Whatever, you know, whatever she. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's, uh, she's wonderful in this. And I love the juxtaposition of her sort of, uh, you know, 23rd, uh, 22nd century. Uh, person with with Picard and and I, lo- mm-hmm. I love him saying that and then she 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 has the reference to call him out on the fact that he's Ahab but then when he quotes it she says I never read it <laughs> love that yeah. love that line a lot it was really good I like the the development of data here mm-hmm. I like the the fact that he was actually tempted and rewatching it I did not remember that he wasn't uh that he wasn't tempted all along. Like I couldn't, I couldn't remember uh, how long he was tempted. I'd forgotten that line at the end about how uh, at the very end of the movie, he says, they say, uh, he, I was tempted for a time. And he says, how long of a time? And he said, point. So it was point four two three seconds. And he's like, yeah. for a, for an Android, that is an etern- like an eternity. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Yeah. That was fun. And I, I did enjoy that. I, I was, annoyed with the later installments that they like look you guys have the technology now data i'm sure was like cataloging this you could put you could like grow skin and put it on this dude so that he could feel goosebumps all the time like in his quest to be more human why wouldn't he that's possible Body modification it's possible uh it, you know i don't know it may be a, a, a issue of ethically sourcing human skin um, <laughs> oh, they just grow that shit, man. Come on. Yeah. It's, it's the future. <laughs> Maybe, but that's not what happened in this. I think he, like, they actually took a crewman's skin and uh, put it on his face, which, ugh, it's so gross. Yeah. So gross. Um, lo- loved, loved all, loved, loved so much of this. I, all the stuff between Picard and Lily is real fun. Um, I like I like I like when when he first meets her and then shows her space or shows her Earth from space. Mm-hmm. That's super fun. I love when they go into the holodeck and you know fight the Borg uh, with with guns. That's that's a lot of fun. Yeah, just good stuff, man. The Borg sounds Swedish. Uh, yeah, the Borg sounds Swedish. 
Um, I never, I never got the feeling that this was a spe- a specifically a scary film, as many people have said. Uh, hmm. I mean, it's definitely it, there are horror elements in this film. There are, but you know, it opens in a very horror way with that like mm-hmm. needle through his eye and the, uh, the the bursting of the thing through his through his cheek as he wakes up like that. All that's real creepy. They definitely are going for the horror elements here. I think the the most horror element of it was like when that ensign or whatever she was like was calling out to her uh, co-worker and she climbs up the ladder and screams. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th- there, there was that. But, you know, other than that, you know, it was just a Star Trek zombie movie and I enjoyed the shit out of it. I really did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite scenes has always been the uh, battle for the deflector array. Yeah, I think that's my least favorite part of the movie. Really? Uh, and, and like, I don't know about now. I have a lot of nostalgia for it, but just like uh-huh. that, that when I think of this movie, that's one of the scenes I think of, cause it's something you just never got on star Trek and there's no reason not to, but like the magnetic boots on the outside of the mm-hmm. hole, like that was just fun. It's fun. It's fun. Little adventure section. Everything is so slow moving. And so, like, deliberate. It just, it feels like, uh, it's like this movie becomes the motion picture for a second. I'm just like, oh, oh. God. Well, that, to me, that just felt like real space travel, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did. Oh. Yeah, you know, it was just a boring segment for me. I, how, <laughs> how cool was it to see Reginald Barkley for a minute? I enjoyed seeing him. I, I man, he saved, he saved a few Voyager episodes for me back in the day. Yeah, for sure. Um. But yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed seeing him. I by the way, I love James Cromwell as as Zephyr Cochran. Yeah, he's great. Absolutely you wonderful. Told him, you, you told him about the statue. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> I I really I I wish you'd got a little sense that they knew who Lily was. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> they never mention anything about Lily's uh uh you know his history as, as her, his co-pilot. <laughs> mm-hmm. They never tell her that she had a, she, she was a big part of this. And like, it makes me think either Zephyr from Cochran, like wrote her out of history or like, you know, uh, I don't know. It just was weird. It was weird that Lily doesn't get mentioned at all or because that, that she never was. Well, but she was originally. No, she wasn't. Mm. It's a paradox. Yeah, it is a paradox, but it's the kind of time travel paradox we put up with. <laughs> It was always Riker and uh, Riker and mm, LaForge in that in that in that cockpit. I don't agree, um, but maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we 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 don't really know, and and we don't know how time travel is supposed to have worked if, in this. Yeah, scenario. if it's not a paradox, then we're living in an alternate future here. Yeah, for sure. Subsequently, yeah. like well, they 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 went back and created a timeline where the Borg didn't mm-hmm. destroy their Earth. But the Borg still did it. It's it's it is a paradox. It's it's the same thing like in a you, you you talk about an end game how you can go back and change it, but the the future that created you that mm-hmm. put you here still has to exist. Um, so so you know who knows? It just depends on how time travel works. And it truth is it works, we, we have no it idea. It works different ways in Star Trek depending on what the plot requires. Exactly, so. exactly. And, but I, I as far as I know, it's never it's never been that that kind of time travel, like the 12 monkey style where it just always was, always was what it is. Uh, I've never known Star Trek to have that. So I, I wouldn't think that was this, the case here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I want to know which episodes are the episodes where b- before McCoy and Scotty give that guy the recipe for transparent aluminum <laughs> in Star Trek four. <laughs> you realize by giving him the formula you're altering the timeline why how do we know he didn't invent the damn thing <laughs> yeah. so so sloppy come on you gotta know about the temporal prime directive which i don't know if the temporal prime directive exists no. they probably invented the temporal prime directive the original series crew necessitated the temporal prime directive <laughs> In the original series, they would just, like, literally just go back in time and check stuff out. And then, like, they had, like, that that uh, Air Force pilot show up. And they were like, hmm, let's look into his history. Hmm. No, he never did anything. Yeah, he doesn't have to go back. 
Oh yeah. wait, his kids. His kids did. Damn it. All right. Well, he needs to go back and he needs to forget. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um. Well, yeah. Love Zeph from Cochran. I love. I really like the um, Zephram Cochran arc in this movie where he yeah. doesn't want to be a great man. I, lo- I love Riker's line to him. Uh, a great man once said, uh, or, uh, someone, once, be a great someone man. once said, don't try to be a great man. Just be a man and let history make it, make up its mind or something like that. Make its own judgments. Make yeah. its own judgments. And then he said, who said that? <laughs> and he's like, you do 10 years from now. <laughs> right. Rhetorical nonsense. <laughs> Who said that? Rhetorical? Yeah. It's really good. Really, really good. Um, but I, I love, I love, and, and you know, we've talked about, it, I think before on the cast, how Zephram Cochran in the original series doesn't seem to line up with the Zephram Cochran. But I, I, I contend that that's because he steps into the role that he's meant to be, you know? Oh yeah, dude, totally. Like when you look at the way he is here and then the way future Zephram Cochran is in the original series, he is basically Gene Roddenberry. Like they created Gene Roddenberry within the con the context of the Star Trek universe. Like he is a drug addict, drug user, womanizer who d- didn't actually have a vision but stumbled upon one. His vision was money. And then over time became like bought into his own hype and at at the very least acted like he was this like, you know, great person who envisioned all of this stuff Hmm. and did all this stuff on purpose. That is an interesting interpretation of that. I like it. Oh, I totally think that's what they did. That's fun. (laughs) Uh, well, any other big points you want to make about First Contact before we get into trivia and quotes? Um, not really. I, I enjoy everything bec- between Worf and, and Picard here. Uh, oh, I yeah, I love the Worf and Picard stuff. I did, because DS9 mentioned that uh, the Defiant was specifically made to fight the Borg at some point, uh, I, this is the only time that it actually makes a ton of sense for Worf to be in one of these movies, I think. Uh, what, so what's his, his explanation in the last one is the marriage, is that right? Uh, yeah, he was at the wedding, and I guess he's... You know, he did say in at the end of DS9, I'm not a diplomat, so uh, the Ambassador Wharf thing was not going to work out. I mean, but um, I think there was a deleted scene in Nemesis that, that brought that up. Oh, is Nemesis after DS9's over, I guess? It, it absolutely is. And okay. apparently after DS9, he's just like, you know what? I want to be with my family again. And he like went back and like started serving on board the Enterprise again. That's fun. Huh. Okay. Well, a little bit of a backtrack for his character, but like uh, from from I really like all the development, especially with his culture and like him getting to know the Klingons better and everything. I, I really do love all that in DS9. So it's it, it, I, I'd like to see him dive more into that. Yeah, and it makes sense to me. Like he became an ambassador at the end of DS Nine, and he was like, "I am not a diplomat." Oh uh, yeah, all right, all right. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. And then you know what? You're not. You you aimed a phaser at a view screen. Yeah, you're not. No, he's not. Q was absolutely right when he said, "Did you eat any good books lately?" <laughs> um. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I hated how uh, how close a proximity it was that they almost blew up the Enterprise here. I'm glad they didn't. I'm like, can we just stop going jumping to you know blowing up the Enterprise in every damn movie? Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad they I'm I'm particularly glad they didn't destroy the Enterprise E because it's so cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I really love it, and uh, the fact that it is not. Uh, you know, you know, it, it survives. It needed to survive. They didn't need to lose lose two enterprises in two movies. That would have been too much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I enjoyed the crap out of this movie, and um, yeah, it's great. It's really. really I don't great. think there's a lot to say about it, honestly. Like I do think that it uh, it did fall in line better with with the subsequent uh, post best best of both worlds uh, Borg episodes with TNG. 
and uh, I think it fell in line better than I had remembered it did. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would say that like because of Hugh and and uh, Picard's uh, you know uh, gamble that he would his. Uh, uh, newfound individualism would uh, infect the Borg. I think, uh, I think at the beginning of first contact and we're like, oh, the Borg are attacking earth again. He's like, you know what? That shit didn't work. And he's right back to like pre Hugh Picard where he's like, it's a Borg. Damn it. And I think that's fair. Yeah. Like, no, it destroys everything. They, they destroy everything. Well, I also think there's a difference between learning to, believe that a Borg can be redeemed once they're separated mm-hmm. from the hive and still wanting to fight the hive. Mm-hmm. And I, I do feel like Picard, like he, I think he, I feel like they referenced, um, those subsequent, uh, those post, uh, best of both worlds episodes when Picard says to Lily, I will not sacrifice the Enterprise. We've made too many compromises already, too many retreats. They invade our space and we fall back. We assimilate entire worlds and we fall back. Not again. Um, so I, I think I think he's fed up, dude. And I, I'm I'm on board. This is this is good stuff. Yeah. And I I like that he like takes a step back and comes back to himself. But uh, I don't know. I like Picard here. Me too, man. Me too. And I really am just finding as I do so much of this rewatch that like a lot of Star Trek that I, I, (laughs) that I don't really think about as my favorite Star Trek. I keep going Mm -hmm. like, Oh wait, that was actually really good. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Like there's just like, I keep finding myself really liking a lot of the Star Trek that I, you know, may, it may have in the past thought was like, whatever. And it's Okay. But yeah, first contact so good. Um, first contact not being that. First contact is what I say is my favorite movie, and and I do yeah. love it. But uh, but even like like you said, generations and uh, that well, we're going to talk about it next time. But Nemesis, there are some dumbass things in Nemesis. <laughs> but yeah, I don't hate Nemesis as much as I did before after my rewatch of Nemesis. Yeah, this is you know. I don't hate it, hate it, but it's bad. There's some bad moments for sure, but there, there there's some redeeming value there. Um, so I guess we'll get into that next time. Uh, ooh, any uh, any quotes or trivia, real quick? Um, I you know I just like generations. Uh, I, I have you know it's all the quotes. I love all the quotes. Uh, Zephyr, everything was Zephyr Cochran, man. Everything about him, you know, taking a leak. Um, just. I I watched First Contact probably it was one of the most watched Star Trek films for from my childhood so I've got a ton of that stuff memorized and uh it's just every every line I I just love that movie and I love the <laughs> I love the dialogue um this is another uh Braga and more same guys that did Generations and all good things See, uh, as far as trivia is concerned, um, what what's great is like Berman out of the gate just really wanted to do another time travel movie <laughs> and went to Bo- more in Braga and they were like, well, we want to do a Borg movie. And they like apparently decided right on the spot, like standing outside of the heart building, decided, OK, we'll do both. Nice. <laughs> it's really fun. I want to write stuff sometimes. Like the idea of coming up with those big big overarching plots is so much fun to me. Mm-hmm. Like the, the idea of being like, I want to write this kind of, how can we resolve those two things where they really make sense, you know, and they do a great job of it here. And it's, it's super fun, man. Yeah. And apparently like the, the uh, initial ideas were they were going to send them back to the Roman empire. And then they're like, no, Picard and Togo wouldn't work. And then, <laughs> and then they were going to do the American civil war and then settled on the Italian Renaissance and um, apparently, according to Moore, there was a, a story would have found Picard and company searching history for a group of time traveling Borg uh, happening upon a Renaissance village. The crew would hear stories about strange creatures uh, taking over neighboring villages. And then we begin to realize that it's the Borg and we track them down to a castle near the village where a nobleman runs a feudal society. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and Data becomes our spy, impersonating an artist's apprentice. 
And uh, he becomes friends with Leonardo da Vinci, who at the time was working for the nobleman as a military engineer. You would have sword fights and phaser fights mixed together in 15th century Europe. It, it risked becoming really campy and over the top. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that all sounds, that sounds like That sounds horrible. That sounds like Army of Darkness Star Trek edition. Like, when I start re- when I read stuff like this, I'm like, oh, this is why Nemesis happened. This is why Insurrection happened. Like, certain elements of that were just like, oh, man, some of this, just like, you guys. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah, the one image that... Uh, kept bringing them back though to the time period they actually wound up going to the birth of the federation braga was obsessed with uh the image of the vulcans coming out of the ship and he said he wanted to see the birth of star trek and mm. uh to him that's what made the time travel story fresh and that's true whenever i think of first contact i think of the, sh- the vulcan coming out of that ship interesting i i definitely that's a big part of what i think about with this I mean, it's the name of the movie, you know, it's First Contact. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's funny because it's, when I think about what's in First Contact, I I think I tend to land on the Borg stuff a little more, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, the movie's called First Contact and it's very clearly Mm -hmm. about that first moment of Star Trek. Yeah, it's really great. Ah, It's a great, it's a great movie. Part of the reason Lily wasn't, uh, more of a legend to these people was because in the original script she was Ruby the photographer. Oh, funny! And uh, it would have revolved around them trying to save an injured Zephram Cochran and like just pretending to be like Picard pretending to be Zephram Cochran himself and like making the flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I like what they did here a lot so better. They, yeah, they eventually got to it, man. They eventually got to what we liked. Yeah, it's so much fun. All right, well, uh, speaking of Lily, I thought she kind of gets short shrifted in this movie in Mm -hmm. that she, she's at least the, even if they just have to tell a cover story, she should be the first per the person in the story who was his co-pilot. And, uh, cause Uh it obviously was a more than a one man ship because they took the other two of them to do it. So, uh, yeah, I feel like Lily was kind of short shrifted. So I wrote my song this week, uh, from Lily's perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this song is called Ahab. And I uh, had a lot of fun writing it. It was, uh, let me just say if, if they were in fact kind of talking about Jean here on the slide, right. It would make, it would make sense that Lily got the short shrift because it's not like, you know, Star Trek says created by Gene Roddenberry and DC Fontana. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. So I decided to make my song kind of a tribute to Lily. And mm-hmm. it's from Lily's perspective, talking about Picard. So we yeah. still getting that taste of the, the Picard primer and this Picard album, but uh, with through the eyes of Lily, because I always liked her character a lot. And uh, yeah. you know, at the time, I didn't know who Alfred Woodard was, and now I've seen her other things, and I really love Alfred Woodard. She's so mm-hmm. good, so good, so good. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, that is about it for us. Check out this song coming up now. This is Ahab. Uh, we'll be back next time. Peace. Live long and prosper. I see the hate in your eyes, and it's no surprise. You told me what they did, you told me of the hive. Oh, you may try, but you can't deny. You swear you're so evolved. But that's all lies Yeah, you're just another Ahab with his whale You picked up the scent, you're on its tail How far will you go to bring it down? Cause your crew will follow you, or just look around You put on a good ruse, that see right through Your talk of drawing lines has failed to prove that what you want to do is anything but crude. You just want to make them pay for what they did to you. Yeah, you're just another Ahab with his whale. You've picked up the scent, you're on its tail. How far will you go to bring it down? Cause your crew will follow you and just look around.
tell you that they think you're being a fool They're impressed with all the valiant things they've seen you do But my name is Lily and I'm a legend in your time So I'll be the one to hold this mirror up so you can peer inside You're just another Ahab with his whale You picked up the scent, you're on its tail How far will you go to bring it down? Cause your crew will follow you, just look around Yeah, they will follow you all the way down To reach out to us, hit us up at StarTrekUcast.com, at StarTrekUcast on Twitter, or search for the Star Trek Universe Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. And if you want to hear more from David C. Robertson, search for the DC On Screen Podcast in your podcast app now, or go to Maladjusted.tv for his comedy sketches. If you want to hear more from me, Matthew Carroll, search for the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or the Orville Universe Podcast in your podcast app, or check out my music. Just search for Matthew Carroll wherever you listen to music. 